when I come out of prison um, and I went I got to Wigan went to Wigan Pier and I started taking exercise and it was like how can I explain it is everything I wanted the, the, the ecstasy and the heroin kind of came hand in hand you know what I mean uh, but then I started taking heroin more and more through the week um, and the ecstasy less and less over the weekends Anyway, it progressed over the years of dabbling in and out of heroin. Um, and then when I was about 22, 23, I'd, uh, I was fully addicted to it. Being expelled from school, drinking alcohol at nights in the streets, running around. Went to clubs, taking class A's. Throughout my 20s, that progressed to uh, heroin and smoking crack. Yeah, it, 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 it extended to hard, hard substances in powder forms of speed, cocaine. One substance to another, alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, um, amphetamine, crack, all through my life. I lost careers, lost my career in the army through substance misuse. Alcohol, ecstasy, cocaine, and then eventually um, hit a peak at crack cocaine. Um, stuck to crack cocaine, or should I say, crack cocaine stuck to me for about 10, 11 years. You've reached a point, you know, when you have to get to about 25 after that, he's not getting back the same as what you once did, you're not enjoying it as much. You're a bit like flogging a dead horse. Straight after school, I got straight into chefing, and uh, the, kind, the two kind of go hand in hand, like, you know, the drinking, the smoking, the sniffing, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then in the last, Four to five years, it got really bad. It got really, really messy. You don't really know there's an alternative. And the idea of being teetotal, wow, that's, that's, that's scary. Started robbing shops um, to pay for my habit. I just totally lost all um, respect for myself. Like I had no no life at all. It was just drugs all day, every day. And then eventually it got worse and worse. I ended up on the streets for seven years, living on the streets in Manchester. Ended up on the streets in Bolland, begging, um, literally just pretty much waiting to die. Really, it's affected me. Um my mental state as well because I'm not well, you know, mentally well. I've got um, mental health problems. I've got learning difficulties. I ended up in hospital um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, with a DVT in the left side of my groin. Um, and on this ward, there was like everyone had either one or both legs missing, you know. And um, in my head, I, you know, I, at this point, I kind of resigned myself to the fact that I was going to die a junkie, you know. And and when, when the doctors come in and said, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to lose a leg, well, my first thought was, uh, you know, I better stop it was if I lose a leg, I'll get PIP. Couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't see straight, you know, completely dehydrated. I remember even now, like, every blink that I do right now, I remind myself what it was like to not have the water around my eyes, because even blinking was painful. Like, I was that dehydrated, like, when I, that withdrawal was... I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I really wouldn't, it was horrible. It consumes me. Um, got diagnosed with a mental health problem um, at the age of 30. Um, and, and that's a contributing factor to a lot of the problems what I've had throughout my life. Um, yeah, um, if I'm in addiction, I'm, 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 I'll be better off dead, to be honest. 16th of September, I was on this five day binge. Three days in, my daughter was born. But I still didn't go and see her. I smoked my crack. I thought, when my crack's gone, I'll go and see her. That's how selfish I was. And then two days later, I went to see her, trying to see her. Won't let me into the hospital. 
do you know what? It's me, my son's just turned 13 last Christmas, just a week before Christmas. And uh, that was the first birthday I've spent with him without using any substances or drinking. To start with, when I was seeing my daughter, I'd be work away and I'd have half a gram a week. And I thought my drug taking was quite tame compared to how it happened in my 30s. Half a gram of coke a week and six cans of lager. I thought, that's nothing, everyone does that. But then um, when I couldn't see her, um, that's what I went to. And I was doing it pretty much every night. And I was acting out on it because I couldn't deal with the emotions, the loss of not seeing her. So the only way to mask the emotions was to take the drugs, which pushed me further away from her. I was angry. I was threatening my ex-partner on the phone, saying, I'm going to do this, going to do that. Not realising I'm a crackhead. Why would she want me there around that child? And I come to a bridge, and um, I just thought, just kill yourself. During that time in, in hospital, something changed within me, you know. Um, you know, I realised, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't continue to use, do you know what I mean, my, my life. I will end up dead, there's absolutely no doubt about it. And uh, that, that, that kind of revelation had been missing from all the other years that I'd used. My personal experience with Deep, I say it's challenging, but worth it. Yeah, it's very challenging, it's real. Some people class it as scurry, and it, it can because you're talking about your feelings. People don't like talking about their feelings because you, you don't want to let people in. See, I've done, other, I've done other projects in the past and other courses, but with Deep, it's about connecting with them feelings like hurt and the things we've done, and which I've never connected with in the past. It's a good fear. Not one of them fears what should scare you off. It's a good fear. And you feel like you've achieved something once, once you've got through it. At the start of Deep, yeah, it, it was a bit alien. I was all anxious and uh, sweaty palms and stuff. And you know, now I can I can see through that. It was uh, I was full of a lot of guilt and shame and uh, resentments towards people and things. But I just can't ever solve because it, it's in the past. It's looking at yourself and analysing yourself and seeing why you do the things you do and the behaviours and patterns you built up over years and years and years. But what it explained to me was, it, it was like this, uh, how you deny it and you know, you make excuses and you know, like the patterns that you would have. Classic one for me was denial. I could, I could minimalise, I can deflect, I can justify, I can get anger, blame. I could do that about anything, because that's a skill which the addict in me had taught me to know really well. I could do anything, you know. Anything, and I could, I could convince myself I'd done nothing wrong. I was displaying a lot of behaviours of trying to escape reality and re escape my life at home and at school. You know, I was daydreaming a lot, creative writing, imagining I was someone else. You know, and um, through the process of deep, I didn't realise that even as a teenager, when I did discover alcohol, how detached I was. The harms that we cause to others, um, it's helping us to connect with them harms and to. Um, to feel, to feel the feelings, what we should have felt, and, and to, to move on from stuff. And it's, it's about um, looking at stuff what may have happened to us as well. And, um, and it's, it's about giving us a little bit of acceptance. Um, it's like, you, it's, it's about using your past as a reference point, um, not a place to live and dwell in, really. And it brings, oh, you're actually feeling it. Um, a couple of times I, I really felt the pain that I'd put my kids through, which I'd never felt before. I'd seen it in their eyes, but they'd never actually, like I say, they'd never actually told me. So to, to feel that pain, it's, it's, it's made me stronger to, to understand that when I use, I'm not just hurting myself, I'm hurting a lot of people. And... We did um, a psychodrama called Toe Tag, where, you know, you, you, you've personally died um, and you, you, you sat thinking about who, comes to, to uh, identify the body. Had, had to write a eulogy from the children, um, basically put myself in their shoes and pretend that I died um, and how my children would feel. Um. And then you write a eulogy of that person and obviously I've got a son and a daughter so I did it for them. Then you had to go through the scenario of dead and 
who'd be the first people to be told and who'd come and view the body. I started writing it and I just I just broke down and was absolutely hysterical, you know, in floods of tears, uh, thinking about how painful it would be for her and my son to, to have to to have to go through that. First of all, I went to my mum. So I've got a picture of the police knocking at mum's door. And I, this is what I thought mum would say, what's he done again? Then they come in. And I don't think my mum would cry there and then. She, she'd act strong. But behind closed doors, she'd cry. And then they, to Emma, my ex-partner, they go to her. And she'd just say, it's not true. I did my daughter's Megan's, and then I did. I started my son's Riley's, um, but I just I just couldn't do it. I wrote, I think I wrote a line because I just I was bro I was, bro I was broke, um, and then we had to read them out. And I think it was like about an hour or so of listening to other people's and my own reading my own out, and it was just constant like crying um, of the pain that you know you'd cause to someone through dying, through drug use, um, which like again, it's just something you, you just don't think of, do you? you don't think of other people when you're using, so yeah, that was, that was the hardest bit for me. Yeah, it was quite a poignant piece of work, that, um, but it was good, um, it was good even though it was very, very difficult. Because you distort yourself from the truth while you're living it, that's the only way you can carry on. I mean, the only way you can justify doing what we do is to, is to lie to yourself, to say that it's okay, to say that it doesn't matter, that you're not hurting people, and it's all right. And just and all the negative things just come, just become pissed down at you, bend water under the bridge. You know, it's just don't, you don't take you, you can't hold on to all the negativity. So it would, how something would the addict won't let you. Or she would stop doing what you're doing. It's only when you stand still and look back at all the wreckage and the carnage, you realise, well, I couldn't see it in front of me, I can only see it behind me. Some people have seen good in me, but I just never accepted it. I always thought I was this bad person, this monster because that's how I acted at times. The way I treated people. That is the, the, the crux of it, isn't it? You know, in active addiction, you don't see yourself as a good person. You know, you, you just see yourself, you know, you, you're just in, a, in, a, in an existence, you know, and you, you know, so I, I, would, I would hope that someone would be able to show me that I was a good person um, and give me the belief that there's more to my life than the life I've lived. A revelation. The way you look at things that you'd rather forget about in the past or think that you have dealt with in your own terms and it turns out you actually really, really haven't, not in the right way. And it's usually that one thing with it, no, but I've dealt with that, no, that's the thing that you still need to look at because it's still messing up your behaviours now. It showed me, you know, what the problems were because it, it is deep, it is, it is what's inside you, you know, and you sort of can see. Because no one's ever explained to me what's what, because I, I never, I don't see a problem. I've never seen a problem. Even when I was in deep, I would say I'm cured. I've got a problem. I still say that today. Yeah, I still get treatment. I still get, I still get medication, and I still, I still um, do the same things. The only thing I stopped, I've stopped substances. I say I've never, I never connected my feelings, and it's like not the way I've done on deep. You know what I mean? It's just been told it's like a new experience and. An emotional roller coaster. Yeah, it's got its ups and downs, but yeah, it's worth it. To have all them feelings and connect with them all, it was just unreal. But I got through it, and that can be the foundation from where I am, where I am today. I think it's when you've got people from all different backgrounds, natures, and obviously different substances all sat around, and you're all talking and you're relating, 
and your emotions start going and someone says something and you think actually I felt like that or even worse I've treated someone like that and you empathize and you start to get emotional you start to cry you start to realize how much you've been carrying around with you the whole group experience is very powerful and very sobering it's, it's, it's turned, turned my life around it has and I've got morals and I've got values and I've got beliefs, I've got dreams and I've got aspirations and before I didn't have any of that. That it starts here today, that everything's not yet written and I don't have to repeat the same mistakes and I can use the skills I've learned to be the best father I can and to be a good provider and a good human being. Being able to cope with things and with people, because you know, I still I'm clean and sober, but I'm still crazy, and I still find certain people difficult to cope with. Um, but I've now got tools in place so that it doesn't overwhelm me, and I've got coping strategies. Um, and someone said to me very early on, if I put this first, everything else will fall into place, and I didn't quite believe them to begin with. How to cope in situations. Yeah, yeah, it's not always going to be a smooth road, is it? It's, I'm going to have ups and downs and I can't always turn to using when, as and when my head tells me to, because that's not the answer. I've, I've learned that using is not the answer to, to problems, to having a good time and, yeah. Drink and drugs are just covering the real person. You can't see yourself, I couldn't see myself. I yeah, respect people, I respect people, you know what I mean, try and do the next right thing. Be honest and be kind, you know what I'm saying? Whereas like throughout my addiction, it was just, I was just pure selfish, you know what I mean? Like I say, it's all about me. I know it, that, that's when I done my life story, that's what I got from doing my life story. I noticed how selfish and all about self I was, you know what I'm saying? Now, today I'm a good person today, you know what I mean? That's what it's about, isn't it? I recognise the faults that's happened. You know, and, I'm, and I help other people. That I've got a life worth living, you know, and, I, and I'm, a, you know, I've got, I've got potential. I've got, you know, this is what my recovery has given me. It's given me, it's, you know, and deep, and you know, it's, it's given me a belief in myself that I never, I never had. What would I say? If I could go in, I'd probably end up slapping myself. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> good one. <laughs> um, I think I'd say, you know, like, um, what you're doing now, it, there's, there's only there's two outcomes, like a long jail sentence or death. You know, if you if you connect it to deep, you'd um, you get what they say, don't they? A life beyond your wildest dreams, sort of thing. You know, not materialistic, but just getting up in the morning and not having to worry about things, and you know, living a normal life. So, if I could give you any advice, it'd be grab it with both hands and run with it. Listening, dickhead. You've got a kid now. You need to grow up. You know what it was like when you didn't have a dad. Do you want this to happen to her? Get get off your ass and sort yourself out. That's exactly what I'd say. Because the life you're living isn't reality. You're living your own version of reality. And if you want to join in and participate with everyone else's version, then come and do this and see what everyone else sees. I just tell them that things are going to change. Um, tough times don't last. Tough people do, and just give them a little bit of a um, little bit of insight of what's to come. Because I'm coming up to six months clean, and I couldn't believe that I'd be sat here today. Uh, my eight-year-old self, I'd, I would have held and said, "It's going to be all right. You are going to be all right. It's not going to be this way forever." Say, I've, I've never opened up to anyone and I've lost everything I have, I've had and on, and on Christmas it was the worst 
year of my life and I was lucky that I had the people from deep and Acorn House around me and I'd like to thank them so dearly so much because I'd lost contact with my children again after 46 minutes after years of being away from uh, people that supported me gave me Christmas dinner uh, clothes given you know, I'm really grateful for my life today. You know what I mean? You know, I'm grateful that I wake up in the morning and I haven't got the urge to use, you know what I mean? I, I'm grateful that I've got friends. I'm grateful that I've got family, you know. I've, I'm grateful that, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm truly grateful for everything that I've been given. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Simon for putting up with my bullshit. Uh, also, Pete Taylor for taking me in. I'd like to say thank you to Acorn House, the people that was there. I don't know the names because I can't remember. The people that have helped me in the course that deep, which is yourself, Steve Cross. You're a very good man. You, you know, you've been very supportive. Steve Cross, my counsellor on deep, I want to thank him massively because without him, you know, being able to delve into me and, and see, see, see in me something that I'd never seen in myself. Steve, my therapist, you're the uncle I needed in my life from being a kid to just cut out my bullshit and tell me straight, to be honest. Uh, you've really helped me in every way possible. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything you've done for me. With respect to the councillors, thanks very much. Pete Taylor, um, Anthony Paulette, Pete Fielding, uh, everybody's been been more than more than helpful. Anthony Paulette, the caretaker. Pete Fielding, who works at the house as well. Steve Cross is brilliant, Steve's brilliant, John's brilliant, Natalie's brilliant, Danielle's brilliant, and I thank you all for all you've helped, all you've done to help me. Yeah, I'd like to thank all the staff here at Phoenix Mill, um, support me in the past, my care manager, my family, um, my councillor Steve. All the Acorn staff who, who know me have seen me grow, and it, I owe it all to them who've helped me in every single aspect of my life. Um, so thank you very much. The nurses and the doctors on on that ward that I was on, because um, without them, I wouldn't be here. Emerging Futures, Damien, because he, he was the guy that referred me to come here. My, the people in my group, you've helped me look at myself, realise I'm not all bad, because I love every single one of you, and I don't think any of you are all bad. Uh, we've helped each other get through some dark stuff, and we're going to come out the other end. So keep going, I love you all. I want to thank um, Paul Gell. Um, he was a drug worker at Carnarvon Street. Steve Dodd, um, another worker, a ramp worker at Carnarvon Street. And to Laura McCovery Worker, she's um, leaving now, so but she's going to watch me on um, on YouTube. So hi, hi and bye to you. Just want to thank my sponsor, um, Adam Tomlinson, because it's him who kind of like got me into Acorn, and I want to thank all the Acorn staff. Some of the staff members at Smithfield Detox who got me to a point where you know I didn't, I, you know, the, the, the you know me uh, to detox me, you know Rob Floyd, um, one in particular. And if I've missed anybody else, that's because I can't remember. Because the people that know me know that I don't remember. Oh yeah, and Derek as well because Derek's helping me. Words can't really describe what people have, have, have given me. Um, they've given me another chance at life and I, I really am appreciative. My daughter Megan and Riley, who've been there for me. My little sister Kate, uh, she helped me when I was absolute rock bottom, put my clothes on when I couldn't dress myself, drove me to the hospitals, you know, got me to Midas, helped me through the darkest days of my withdrawal stayed with me every step of the way. I'm doing you proud, Kate. <laughs> Here we are. Hopefully she'll be watching this now, so thank you, sis. All my aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews that have stood by me, and I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. To the mother of my child, I'm sorry. And to my mum and dad, I'm sorry and hopefully I won't let you down again in the future. Thank you to Emma, do you know what I mean? She deserves a gold medal for putting up with me and uh, persevering. To Alicia, my stepdaughter, who couldn't stand me. She's got half my back in life. And Emily, my daughter, I love her to bits. Dad, I've done you proud. <laughs> I love you. Yeah, that's it, I'm gonna go. <laughs>
Yeah. I'm gonna go. No, I'm not. I'm alright. <laughs> yeah. It's been my rock my entire life. Really has. And uh, I hate. I hate that I let him down when I did. But I know that doing this and completing this is the best thing I can do to make up for that and I'm doing it, so, you know. <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. And you won't see me again, hopefully. Unless I'm helping. And that's it, bye-bye.